Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to be reading this book about the Galapagos Islands. So let's just dive right in. Here we go. Galapagos Islands. How cute. So we're going to read I think we're going to read this part. We're definitely going to read the Tour of the Islands, Wonderland of Wildlife, and Island Life. Oh yeah, we're definitely reading this page. A world of their own. Welcome to the incredible and unique island world. The Galapagos Islands make up an archipelago, meaning a chain of islands in the Pacific Ocean. Their nearest major neighbor is the South American country Ecuador, which claims the islands as part of its territory. Ecuador's coast is over 559 miles away. Isolated from other lands, and with no humans settling on the islands for thousands of years, the Galapagos have developed differently from other places. Unique and extraordinary plants and animals have flourished on the islands, astounding scientists, thrilling visitors, and making the islands world famous. Let's tour the islands. What a neat shot from above. That's really cool. Meeting point. There are 19 islands and over 100 islets in the Galapagos. They are all found at a junction in the Pacific Ocean where three tectonic plates meet and four different ocean currents flow into each other. All right, let's see if we can name all the ones on here. I see Genovesa, Marchena, Pinta. Then there's the equator. We have Fernandina, Isabella, San Salvador, Bartolome and Bainbridge, Rabida, Pinzon, there's the city of Puerto Villamil, Floriana, Santa Cruz, Beltra Island, the town of Puerto Isidreor, Santa Fe, San Cristobal, the town of Puerto Baquerizo Moreno, the Espanol. Can you see? There, yeah, you can. Okay. Right. Violent volcanoes. We're going to answer some questions about volcanoes. So first we have, how did volcanoes form the islands? The Galapagos were formed by volcanoes on the Pacific Ocean floor. When an underwater volcano erupts, lava and hot gases from deep within planet Earth travel out through the crust. The lava cools and hardens in the cold seawater. Over time, many eruptions cause layers of rock to build up from the ocean floor until their peaks rise above the sea, forming islands such as the Galapagos. What do eruptions leave behind? When it cools, some lava forms patterns such as Cueva del Cascajo, a lava tube that is almost two miles long on Santa Cruz. It was formed when thin lava flowed down a slope and the outside cooled faster than the inside which continued to flow and left a hollow space behind. That's pretty cool. What is a caldera? A caldera is a volcano that collapses into itself to form a large, roughly circular crater. There are a number of calderas in the Galapagos. The biggest is Sierra Negra on Isabella Island. It is 4.5 miles by 5.75 miles wide. Enormous. Are any Galapagos volcanoes still active? Volcanoes can be active, meaning they're able to erupt, extinct, meaning they won't erupt again, or dormant, or they haven't erupted for a long time but still could. There are a number of active volcanoes in the Galapagos. In 2015, Wolf Volcano erupted on Isabella Island. It spewed out red-hot lava and a massive column of smoke and ash in the zone. So, it says scientists divide up 
the different landscapes and climates of the Galapagos into zones, the coastal, humid, and arid zones. Each zone features different plants and habitats for creatures. Let's see the coastal zone. The coastal zone is where the land meets the sea. A range of plants grows here, including a creeping vine called Beach Morning Glory and low-growing sesuvium, which provides a carpet of color, turning green in the rainy season and pink and red in the dry season. Many species of mangrove trees grow along the coast and provide breeding and nesting places for frigate birds and pelicans, among other bird life. The humid zone. Higher areas of some of the larger islands receive plenty of rainfall to form a humid zone, allowing forests of scalacea trees to grow up to 65 feet tall. Ferns, orchids, and mosses grow on or around these trees, providing homes and shelter for many different species, including finches, the Galapagos dove, and the Galapagos giant tortoise. And we have the arid zone. Occupying much of the islands' is land, the arid zone is made up of dry and often rocky ground. Despite the tough conditions, some plants do flourish here, including acacia and palo santo trees, prickly pears, and other cactuses. These in turn help provide food, moisture, and shade for animals such as land iguanas, rice rats, and lava lizards, which all live in this zone. Here it says unique blooms. The unique islands are home to over 600 native plants, many not found anywhere else in the world. These include the arid zone's lava cactus, which grows in spiny clumps up to 23 inches tall and starts off as a yellow plant before aging to a gray color. Its flowers bloom for just a handful of hours each year. Lava cactus. Close up. Getting prickly. Look but don't touch. These strange plants are prickly pears. They are perfectly named as their fleshy leaves, which grow up to almost five inches long, are covered in lots of super sharp stiff hairs or spines. Some types of prickly pear are found only on the Galapagos Islands. The plants produce tiny seeds, which are just uh, 0.18 of an inch long, but boy do they grow. Mature plants reach up to 43 feet tall with thick stems more like tree trunks. Some prickly pear plants are 150 years old. Let's see here. Food for thought. Different creatures feast on the prickly pear. Cactus finches, for example, drink the sticky nectar found in the plant's yellow-colored flowers. Ground finches peck at the plant's fruits and seeds. Tortoises and land iguanas get much of their water from eating the thick, juicy leaves. Top 10 Islands. Though these are in no particular order. Number one is Santa Cruz Cracks. The most populous island, Santa Cruz, features the cracks, which are steep, narrow canyons with sheer drops. Formed when lava cooled, they're popular with hikers and swimmers. It's very pretty. Number two, Santiago Island's Toilet. A lava formation called Darwin's Toilet has a pool that empties and refills with the tides, just like a toilet. Number three, Isabella Island Peaks. Isabella Island contains the Galapagos' highest point, Wolf Volcano, which stands 1,609 miles tall. Number four is Fiery Fernandina Island. La Cumbre Volcano on Fernandina Island has a deep crater at the top that's four miles wide. Number five is the Bainbridge Rocks. These islets lie off the coast of Santiago Island. One is made up of a worn-away volcanic crater with a turquoise lake that attracts flocks of flamingos. Number six is the Floriana Island Treasures. Around 100 people live on this island. It features the Devil's Crown, a ring of rocky spines, 
with a shark infested coral reef inside. Number seven is San Cristobal waters. On San Cristobal, you'll find the Galapagos' only major freshwater lake, El Junco. Number eight is Rabida Island Sands. Rabida Island was formed partly by lava rich in iron, which gives its beaches a dark red color. Number nine, the Bartolome Island Steps. Bartolome Island has a 375 step staircase, which you can climb to reach the island's peak. And number 10 is Española Island Caves. Around 4 million years ago, Española has, has ocean caves and sandy bays home to marine iguanas. Let's read about the wonderland of wildlife. Only on the islands. The Galapagos are home to unique species of plants and animals called endemic species. The ancestors of the island's wildlife arrived there in a variety of ways. Plant seeds would have been carried to the islands by the wind, the sea, or even inside birds, landing on the islands inside their poop. Ancestors of today's Galapagos wildlife may have been carried there by the ocean currents. Shelled animals, such as tortoises, may have arrived by floating on their own shells. Others may have floated on pieces of wood, using the wood like rafts. There are around 40,000 Galapagos fur seals forming large colonies around the rocky shorelines. These colonies are noisy. The seals make loud barking sounds to communicate with each other. The large painted locust with parts colored orange and lime green is found on almost all the islands in the Galapagos and nowhere else. It grows up to three inches long and forms an important part of the diet of both lava lizards and Galapagos hawks. Let's read about Lonesome George. Lonesome George was discovered on Pinta Island in 1971. He proved to be the last surviving Pinta Island tortoise. When he died in 2012, at the age of about 102, the species became extinct. Here's the Galapagos sea lions. Galapagos sea lions are one of the island's biggest endemic species. They grow up to 8 feet long, and at up to 55 pounds weigh more than 3 adult men. Wait, 250 kilograms to 550 pounds weigh more than 3 adult men. They eat mostly sardines. Flightless cormorants cannot fly, obviously, and have short, stubby wings. These large birds are agile swimmers, though, and use their long neck and bill to lunge and spear octopuses, fish, and eels. Oh boy, look at this guy. Crabtastic. The Sally Lightfoot crab is one of the Galapagos' most colorful creatures. Its two to three inch shell and legs are a riot of red and other colors. The crab is named after a famous Caribbean dancer because of how quick and nimble it is. It can run forward, backward, or from side to side, jump from rock to rock, and even clamber up vertical ledges or cliff faces. Its speed makes it hard for predators to catch. It says not picky. These crabs mostly eat algae found along the shoreline, but they will try almost anything from scavenging parts of dead creatures to catching other smaller crabs. They even nibble on ticks picked from marine iguanas. Top 10 Island Birds Number 1 here is the brown pelican. These four feet tall birds use their big bill and the pouch that hangs below it as a strainer. They gulp in many gallons of seawater containing fish and let the water drain out of their bill so they can swallow the fish whole. Number two is the Galapagos dove. If a predator threatens their young dove, parents will walk away from the nest, faking injury to lure the attacker away. Number three is the mangrove finch. Found only on Isabella Island, these finches eat grubs and insects. With only around 100 left, they're one of the world's rarest bird species. Number four is the Galapagos hawk. 
there are only around 300 Galapagos hawks left. They eat lizards, rats, and giant centipedes. Here's the red-footed booby. These all-terrain birds travel 62 miles in a single flight and dive into the sea to catch fish. Here's the lava heron number six. These endemic wading birds are camouflaged by their gray color, but during the breeding season, the male heron's legs turn orange. Number seven is the waved albatross. These long distance flyers travel to the Galapagos to breed. The female lays just one egg, which can take two months to hatch. Number eight, my favorite Galapagos bird, the Galapagos penguin. Think of penguins and you think of ice and the poles, but this species makes its home right on the equator. Number nine is the brown noddy. These seabirds nod to each other during courtship. They often perch on the heads of brown pelicans hoping to steal fish. And number 10 is the red-billed tropic bird. These birds boast incredibly long tail feathers, around 17 inches long, about half of their overall length. Let's meet these marine iguanas. I think they're really cool. Say hello to the world's only sea-swimming lizard, the incredible marine iguana. Big beasts. The marine iguana is endemic to the Galapagos Islands and varies greatly in size depending on which island it lives. Iguanas on Genovesa Island weigh 2 to 4 pounds, while those on other islands tend to be heavier. The largest are found on Isabella Island. Some measure more than 3 feet in length and weigh 28 pounds, about the same weight as 3 well-fed pet cats. That's one way to compare it. White wakes. Marine iguanas are mostly dark gray, but males change color during the breeding season with blotches of red and green on their body. To complete the look, many marine iguanas seem to wear a crusty white wig, formed by salt from the sea, sneezed out by the iguanas and landing on their head. Famous naturalist Charles Darwin describes them as hideous looking. A little harsh. Love the sun. Marine iguanas are cold-blooded creatures, so they need to warm up by basking in the sun for hours each morning. When they swim in the cold ocean waters, their heart rate slows to half its normal rate to help the creatures save energy. There he is swimming. That's cool. Swim for snacks. Marine iguanas are vegetarians and live off algae. Iguanas swim for their food, swishing their powerful tail back and forth to move through the water. Their strong claws grip rocks while they use their teeth to scrape off algae. Male marine iguanas can stay underwater for an hour or longer and dive down to 32 feet below the surface. These guys are so neat, but what's even neater are the giant tortoises. Here's a little Q&A about them. So let's start with, are they really giant? They are the biggest tortoises in the world. Adults are about 4 feet long, 20 inches tall, and can weigh more than 550 pounds. That's impressive, considering that when they are born, they weigh just 1.2 to 2.6 ounces and can fit in your hand. Goliath, a tortoise from Santa Cruz, grew even bigger. He was 4.5 feet long, 2.25 feet tall, and he weighed a whopping 919 pounds. How many are found on the island? Around 20,000 of these creatures are found in the Galapagos today, but the numbers were quite different in the past. Before humans arrived, there may have been more than 100,000 giant tortoises on the islands. Tens of thousands were killed by sailors for food, and by the 1970s, there were only around 3,000 left. Since that time, breeding programs have helped increase numbers. What do they eat? Look at these guys having a big lunch. Galapagos tortoises are plant eaters. They mostly feed on cactuses, grasses, leaves, and fruit. Young tortoises are particularly greedy and can eat about a sixth of their body weight in food every day. In hard times, tortoises can go without food or water for many months. Are 
there different types of Galapagos giant tortoise? Yes, tortoises that grow up on one island have differences compared to those from other islands. They may vary in size or the shape of their top shell, which is called a carapace. I think that's how you pronounce it. Some islands' tortoises have a dome-shaped carapace, while others have a carapace shaped like a saddle. Underwater life. It says here, more than 400 types of fish and many other marine creatures, including the Pacific seahorse and various sharks, are found in the waters around the Galapagos. Here are some of the most fascinating. The Galapagos shark. The Galapagos shark hunts bony fish, sea lions, and marine iguanas, which it attacks using its 14 rows of sharp teeth. Baby sharks stay in shallow waters for fear of adults of their own species turning cannibal and eating. One visitor to the coastal waters of the islands is the giant ocean sunfish. It's the biggest bony fish in the world. Growing large on its diet of jellyfish and crustaceans, such as shrimp, this fish can measure up to 13.8 feet by 10 feet and weigh more than 4,850 pounds. That's heavier than three cows. Growing up to 13 inches long, King angelfish are brightly colored tropical fish that eat sponges and plankton, but also nibble parasites off fearsome hammerhead sharks. Galapagos clingfish are well named. These strange fish have a large sucker on their underside, which they use to attach themselves firmly to rocks so they can feed without the waves and tides washing them away. Adult Galapagos green turtles lay ping-pong ball-sized eggs on the shore, but spend the rest of their time at sea. They are mostly vegetarian, but young turtles will eat what they can, including jellyfish. And here we can see an eel. Many patterned fish inhabit the waters around the islands, including the zebra moray, a strikingly striped fish that lives close to the seafloor, where it can grow up to five feet long. Oh gosh, <laughs> look at this, the red-lipped batfish. This doesn't look, this looks photoshopped, this looks, <laughs> oh my gosh, anyway, let's read about it. It says, with its bright red puffy lips, this fish looks as strange as its name. What's more, it is a terrible swimmer and prefers to walk along the ocean floor using its fins as feet. That's, it looks totally like photoshopped. I don't even know. Let's look at some more unusual inhabitants. Here's the magnificent frigate bird. These birds steal food from others in mid-air. The males inflate a throat pouch to impress females. Here's the fiddler crab. Fiddler crabs change color, turning dark in the day and lighter at night. Males have one huge claw to impress females. Here's the pink iguana. The pink iguana was only confirmed as a new species in 2009. It is found on Isabella Island and nowhere else. The Galapagos Mockingbird. Curious and fearless, these birds can fly, but they sometimes choose to run after their prey instead. The Pacific Seahorse. The female of this striking creature produces the eggs, then puts them in a pouch in the male's body to keep them safe until they hatch. Number seven is the scalloped hammerhead. This strange shark can see behind and above itself, but cannot view where it's in front of his nose. Number eight is the trumpet fish. These super slim fish can change color to look like the fish they are hunting. That's sneaky. Number nine is the lava lizard. This lively lizard guards its territory fiercely. It performs a series of press-ups to show off its strength and warn off predators. And number ten is the concentric puffer. Look at this roundy round round fish. This fish protects itself from predators by puffing up its body so that it looks too big to attack. Pretty smart. Look at these birds. These are blue-footed boobies. Named after the Spanish word for foolish, this comical-looking bird is a firm favorite of tourists. 
the blue-footed booby appears slightly clumsy on land as it waddles around on its bright blue feet. At sea and in the air, though, it is masterful. The bird folds back its wings as it dives steeply and plunges into the sea at speeds of over 55 miles per hour. Look, at, he's like showing off like, yep, I got blue feet. Let's read about these fabulous feet. Boobies appear very proud of their bright blue feet. Males perform complicated and goofy dances to impress females in the breeding season. <laughs> anyway, I was going to say like humans or birds. Anyway, their feet are also used to cover young chicks to keep them safe and warm. Younger, healthier birds tend to have brighter feet. Island hunters. These Galapagos creatures grab their dinner in many ways, as the, these amazing hunters prove. Here's the vampire finch. The vampire finch weighs just 0.5 ounces, but when insects and seeds are scarce, it pecks at larger birds to drink their warm blood. It will also smash other birds' eggs by rolling them downhill, using its feet to make the eggs crash into rocks. The vermilion flycatcher. This bright red bird stands out not just visually, but because of its outstanding reactions in the air. With very sharp eyesight, it can catch whizzing flies, beetles, and bees. The flycatcher can also hover in midair and swoop down on insects perched on the ground. The Galapagos Racer. Wow. One of the island's as few land snakes has developed a taste for fish, so it goes fishing. The racer will slither along coastlines and hang over the edge of rock pools before lunging to pluck small fish out of the water with devastating accuracy. And here's the Galapagos giant centipede. Looks gross. Most centipedes are 0.4 to 0.8 inches long, but this centipede grows as long as a large ruler, 12 inches. Ew. It hides in large cracks and crevices waiting for prey, such as large insects, lizards, and even rats, which it grips with its 46 legs and injects with a deadly venom. Yeah, we're going to turn the page now. Let's read about island life. Ship Ahoy. Until the building of airports on the islands, every human visitor arrived by boat. Find out which vessels sailed to the Pacific Ocean to reach the Galapagos. So, 1535. In 1535, the Bishop of Panama, Tomas de Belanga, was sailing close to the coast of South America, heading for Peru. When the winds calmed and the ocean current started carrying his ship westwards out into the Pacific Ocean. The ship became the first ever to reach the Galapagos. The bishop was not impressed by the islands and described the birds there as so silly they know not how to fly. The 1600s. The Galapagos Islands were added to maps in the late 16th century. In the following century, they were used as a hideout by pirates. 1784 to 1860. From the 1780s, the islands were used as a base for whaling ships. Whalers hunted sperm whales for their oil. They also captured Galapagos fur seals for their skin and giant tortoises for their meat. Between 1784 and 1860, whalers took more than 100,000 tortoises from the islands. Herman Melville, a sailor on a whaling ship, wrote a famous novel about a whale called Moby Dick. Little fun fact there. 1807. No one lived on the island until the eccentric adventurer Patrick Watkins settled on Floriana Island in 1807 for several years. He used to kidnap sailors from passing ships and get them to work for him, and once he even stole a ship to sail to Ecuador. 1939 to 45. U.S. forces sent ships and planes to the Galapagos during World War II. They built a base and airstrip on Balfour Island to guard against enemy submarines. The airstrip later became Seymour Airport. 2011 In 2011, an extraordinary boat reached Santa Cruz Island. The 100-foot-long planet solar Turinor isn't powered by wind or diesel engines, but by solar panels. Here it is down here. 
which turns sunlight into electricity. It's the world's largest solar boat and docked at the Galapagos on its way across the Pacific on a round-the-world journey. And today... Today, the Galapagos welcomes dozens of boats and ships. Small cruise liners and large yachts allow people to live on board, but explore the islands during the day. Pirates. In the time between the islands being discovered in the 16th century and people settling there permanently, the Galapagos had a wild history as a place where pirates moored, met, and battled. So sorry if you hear the rooster outside, it's late at night, anyway. Pirate ships used the Galapagos as a place to escape to after their raids. They were far enough from the South American coast to avoid being chased, but close enough to the main shipping routes to launch new raids. No one knows if they ever buried any of their captured treasure on the islands. By the 17th century, Spain controlled much of South and Central America, Spanish ships ferried gold and other riches back from these regions to Europe. These ships were often targets for ruthless pirates sailing the Pacific for treasure ships to loot, such as Dutchman Jacob Lermite, clerk, I assume there's no accents, and British pirates John Cook, Richard Hawkins, and Henry Morgan. There's a pirate map over here. It's Galapagos. In 1684, the Bachelor's Delight pirate ship landed on Santiago Island in a bay now called Buccaneers Cove. A member of its crew, Ambrose Cowley, made one of the first detailed maps of the island. He named islands and features after English kings or nobles. These are later changed to Spanish names. The first visit to the Galapagos by British pirate and naturalist William Dampier was in the 1680s on a ship stolen by pirates. He returned to the islands during a voyage in which he captured a Spanish ship packed with gold. He wrote a best-selling book about his travels, A New Voyage Around the World. By 1800, the classic age of piracy was over, but battling didn't stop. An American ship captain, David Porter, hunted down British whaling ships close to the Galapagos in his warship, the Essex. In 1813, he attacked and either captured or destroyed four British vessels. Let's read about Darwin's Voyage of Discovery. Find out how Charles Darwin used the Galapagos as inspiration for his groundbreaking theories. In December 1831, this 22-year-old naturalist boarded a sailing ship, HMS Beagle, at the start of a five-year-long round-the-world voyage. Along the way, Charles Darwin visited the Galapagos, which would inspire his theories that changed how people looked at the natural world. HMS Beagle was captained by Robert Fitzroy on a long voyage making maps and surveys of the sea and coastlines of South America. Darwin kept daily records of every creature and plant he saw at sea or on land when the ship moored. Darwin also collected fossils. He saw how some of these fossils were similar to living species and wondered how new species developed. In September 1835, the Beagle reached the Galapagos, stopping first at San Cristobal Island before later traveling to Floriana, Isabella, and Santiago Islands. Darwin was amazed by the giant tortoises and in five weeks on the islands collected many samples of plants, birds, and animals. He noticed that the wildlife on each island differed and had adapted to suit its environment. Darwin returned home on the Beagle in 1836 full of questions about what he had seen. Over the next 25 years, he worked on his theories and published a book on the origin of species in 1859. In it, he explained how all species of living things developed or evolved from earlier life forms. For example, birds evolved from reptiles, while humans and apes evolved from the same common ancestor. Darwin and the crew of the Beagle ate iguanas and giant tortoises taken from the islands. They also kept two of the tortoises as pets. Living on the islands. 
Learn about how the people known as Gal Galapagueños. Galapagueños. Yeah, Galapagueños. Who call the Galapagos Islands home. On the coast. More than 80% of the Galapagos' 25,000 inhabitants live in four towns or villages, all of which lie on the coast. Most people or their ancestors have come from Ecuador to settle. Around 6,000 people live on the capital, Puerto Baquerizo Moreno, on, Crist on Cristobal Island. Puerto Ayura on Santa Cruz, though, is bigger, with over 9,200 inhabitants. Food and water. The people who live on the islands know fresh water is rare and precious. Most households collect and store rainwater. While some crops, such as plantain and coffee, the Galapagos' main export, are grown locally, most food is brought in by ship. More than 1,100 crates of supplies arrive in ships at Puerto Ayor every day. People at work. Some people farm, fish, or provide services for the local community, such as nurses, teachers, and shopkeepers. Most are involved in the tourism industry, working in national parks, hotels, piloting water taxis, or as guides, teaching visitors about the islands. More than 200,000 tourists visit the Galapagos each year. Playtime. Soccer is particularly popular on the islands. In 2015, Galapagueños celebrated their first player to make it to a FIFA World Cup, female soccer star Denise Andrea Pesantes. That's pretty cool. Oh wow. Galapagos Day. This local woman dressed in bright traditional clothes dances in a parade along the streets to Galapagos' biggest town. The streets of Galapagos' biggest town, Puerto Ayora. She's part of the celebrations for Galapagos Day, a national holiday on the islands every year on February 12th, the day that the islands are celebrated for becoming a territory of Ecuador. It also happens to be the date of the birthday of its most famous visitor, Charles Darwin. It says here, early settlers. For many years, the Galapagos were under Spain's control until 1832 when a general from Ecuador sent 12 men to set up a small colony on Floriana Island. More settlers came and went, and the islands are used as prisons, before larger villages and towns were built. The human population on the Galapagos of the Galapagos has risen from just 1,300 people in 1950 to over 26,000 today. Living with Nature says the natural world of the Galapagos is extraordinary but fragile. To protect the hundreds of rare plants and animal species and their habitats, the government of Ecuador created the Galapagos National Park in 1959. The park covers 97% of the Galapagos territory. Only four of the islands have permanent places for people to live. It says here the islands are left mainly unspoiled and certain parts can be visited only with an official guide. In 1986, a large area of sea surrounding the islands was turned into a marine reserve. However, humans still have a negative impact on the environment through transportation and pollution. Local people have learned to live with the natural wonders around them and depend on them to attract tourists to the islands. A car may have to stop on a road or track to let a giant tortoise slowly cross, while benches in the towns are often occupied by sea lions taking a nap. I love this picture so much. This guy's chopping up his fish, his fresh catch, and here's a sea lion and a bunch of pelicans just staring and waiting and hoping and wishing. The Santa Cruz fish market in Puerto Ayora is often overrun with sea lions, frigate birds, and pelicans on the lookout for a meal. Such creatures will sometimes lurk close to fishing boats as well, hoping to steal some of the fish in the catch. This is cute too. Visitors shouldn't get too close to the animals, but many creatures on the Galapagos are not afraid of humans. Hood mockingbirds are so fearless that they sometimes dip their beak into people's drinks to take a sip. Wow, a whale shark. 
whale shark conservation. Magnificent whale sharks are frequent visitors to the Galapagos Marine Reserve, mostly between June and November. These huge creatures can measure 39 feet long and weigh as much as 20 tons. Pregnant females can carry over 300 babies inside their body. In 2011, to learn more about these mysterious creatures, scientists tagged some to discover their migration routes between Ecuador, Peru, and the Galapagos. More about whale sharks. Whale sharks have an enormous mouth up to 4.5 feet wide, almost as wide as you are tall if you're 4.5 and a half feet tall or 1.4 meters. But relax, they don't feed on people or any large sea life. Instead, they use their mouth as a giant sieve to gather and filter large amounts of tiny plankton to feed on. Top 10 landmarks. There's the lighthouse. A lighthouse stands above Man Beach near Puerto Bacarizo Moreno, warning ships about rocks out at sea. Post Office Bay. In 1793, a barrel was placed on Floriana Island so whalers could post their letters. Sailors who were going home would deliver them for free. Shipwreck. A German World War I ship, the Caragua, sank out at sea near Man Beach. It's now a habitat for fish, sea lions, and sea turtles. Number four, Iglesia Cristo Salvador. This church on Isabella Island features painted scenes of local creatures such as penguins. That's cool. The Great Stone Head. This stone head on Floriana Island tricked archaeologists into thinking it was carved by ancient peoples. It was just a practical joke. It was carved in the 1930s. Here's Darwin's Arch. You can visit many sites named after Charles Darwin, including this archway, which is just off Darwin Island. Here is Pinnacle Rock. Bartolome Island's Pinnacle Rock is a great snorkeling spot. You can swim with penguins, turtles, and even white-tipped sharks. Number eight is the Wall of Tears. This stone wall on Isabella Island was built by prisoners in 1945 to 59. In 1958 to 21, prisoners escaped the islands in a stolen yacht. Here's number nine, the Artful Arch. At Puerto Ayora, you'll find an arch decorated with Galapagos creatures such as iguanas, giant tortoises, and blue-footed boobies. And number ten, the Research Station. The Charles Darwin Research Station on Santa Cruz is home to over 200 scientists. Their work includes hand-rearing Galapagos tortoises. All about conservation. Another Q&A about conservation. What rules do visitors have to follow? Visitors to the Galapagos must not bring any plants or animals which could disrupt life on the island, so people in their bags are checked thoroughly for seeds, insects, and other life. Fires, littering, and flash photography are banned to avoid disturbing the animals, and visitors can only travel to many sites with official guides. The aim is to preserve these incredible islands for future generations of plants, wildlife, and human visitors. What threats do Galapagos wildlife? That doesn't make any sense. What threats do Galapagos wildlife? Many. Okay. Growing numbers of human residents and visitors mean sewage, garbage, and other waste pollute. The land and water. Shipping accidents can be deadly. An oil spill from a tanker ship in 2001 killed more than 15,000 iguanas on Santa Fe. Overfishing the sea surrounding the islands deprives some marine creatures of food. Plus, climate change threatens the delicate balance of life on the islands. How can conservation help? Conservationists have tried to tackle some invasive species such as goats by removing them from some of the islands. People are encouraged to produce less waste and to use renewable energy such as solar power which cause less pollution. Some people have set up breeding programs protecting eggs and young birds and animals until they are ready to be released into the wild. Are any creatures endangered? Yes. 
according to the Galapagos Conservation Trust, over 50 species are critically endangered. These include two species of giant tortoise, the pink lava lizard, and some species of birds such as the mangrove finch and waved albatross. In the 20th century, a number of Galapagos species died out, including a species of flycatcher bird and Darwin's Galapagos mouse. Let's see, yep, that's going to be the end tonight. We're not going to quiz you on anything. That's a little silly for a relaxation video. So that's the end for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a very good, 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 good night.